and he was the uh, lead explorer on our trip to uh, uh, Jeptown. And it was quite a, quite a trip. Uh, we had originally started out with the idea we were just going to look at existing cellar holes. And it didn't take us too long to find out. First, there wasn't too much in information. And uh, there were a lot of cellar holes that just weren't worth looking at. Uh, we thought, you know, the cellar holes would tell us a little bit about life in the 19th century, uh, construction techniques, and how families lived. Some of the questions got answered, but most of them didn't. So, <clears throat> Larry and I went down and did the Jumptown Road, and we visited the places we could get to, and took some photographs. Sadly, some of the photographs were the same as the next one. So the photos you're going to see tonight are representative of the area, but not specifically a site. We can attach names to some of them, uh, but there's things in the uh, sites that are, were interesting to us. For example, we grant uh, foundation pieces, some of them 16 feet long. I don't know how they moved them with the equipment they had at the time, but they're there. Uh, I think as a result of that, we kind of moved from old solar holes of old steel to the uh, solar holes and an abandoned hammer of old steel. And we'll start from there. Now for me, I've been meddling technic for over 35 years. I come from Casco. I moved to Ocean in 98. And in 98, I started hunting some foundations around Ocean Field. And I was finding nice, cool things from the 1800s. And I wanted to see who actually lived there, who lost this thing. And that's how I got interested in all of this. Um, and on display is a good variety of some of the things that I found at some of the cellar holes that we're going to show you today, along with all the cellar holes that I've probably done, 30 to 40 of them just in the town of Otis. Okay. Uh, 
to the west of here because there are a lot of abandoned uh, cell holes all the way to the White Mountain. And we have our share, probably have more than our share here. The reasons, uh, reasons for the uh, uh, abandonment are probably as many as the people who live there. But basically fires, which seem to be all too common in the town at the time. The deaths of the owners. The road was discontinued or relocated. If you look at the old uh, records of the town meeting in Spurs, you'll find that uh, they were continually adding a road, deleting a road, basically arguing about the roads. <laughs> the uh, owners left town, which was another uh, issue, and that probably was uh, particularly uh, current, or not current, but uh, at the time, 1861 to probably 1890, the westward expansion the uh, soldiers coming back from the Civil War, getting free land, and the move was on. The, the uh, population of the town tumbled, uh, and the West <coughs> was the recipient of many of these people. Some structures were moved. Uh, we know that uh, it's gone on, uh, probably from when the town was first settled. The type of foundations, some of them are just really a, a, a depression, uh, which probably meant that it was a, a, a home or a building that was just laid out on, on uh, logs, and that was it. Uh, the next little bit better uh, shape was the uh, ones that were built on boulders and field stone. Uh, as time progressed, the boulders became cut, and they were able to cut some uh, were probably granite. And then finally, uh, most of them, and some of the ones in Jugtown are examples, were very carefully, skillfully cut large sections of granite. Uh, talking to Jean, uh, she thinks that some of that came from the top of Scribner Hill. Uh, as there was a quarry up there. Now, a 16-foot piece of granite isn't something you move uh, very easily. Uh, they were probably done by oxen, and uh, it was done very slowly. The granite probably was used uh, where it showed more than anywhere else. Uh, if it was covered with a porch, it was the back of the house. Uh, it wasn't the nice granite that we see in some of these places. So reasons. Why did we pick the places we picked? Well, first of all, to be honest, I met up with Larry and found he was a resource for Jugtown. It was a package. Twelve sites, uh, good condition, uh, not readily accessible for everybody. We had to use a, an ATV, but... <laughs> you had a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> I said you had a fun time. Huh? Yes, we did. <laughs> uh, the other, other reasons, of course, was we, we had some historical data to go by. So once we identified it, uh, we had some book stuff to back it up. And of course, I already had artifacts that he had collected from these areas. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you have down here, but if you can get down there, it's, a, it's well worth it. Uh, I would know that most of it, or all of it, is Hancock land, and their rules apply if you go there. <laughs> so, how does Jugtown get its name? Well, Spur told me, he said, one day they were having a shooting match in Jonathan Smith's Milliard on the Great Brook. 
and a juggle weapon was set up on his stump. By mistake, someone shot the juggle. He said, the mic, and they lost the liquor. It's always been called <coughs> Chugtown since. An interesting thing, Chugtown uh, is a, we think of as a local name, but the U.S. Computer survey on the 1987 map, 78 map, calls it Drugtown Plain. And they identify a couple of other sites around town, Dunkertown, uh, East Oversfield. And these places all show. So Drugtown is in the big league, I guess. This uh, this is in Jugtown. This is uh, the home of William Hamlin. This was built. This is the oldest one out there. This was built in 1866. Uh, he had bought part of Lot 18, built a house and a barn here. We're standing close to his foundation, looking out, and the only thing that his foundation is mostly filled in. You can see a third of it, and the apple tree is still standing from uh, 1866 out there, and still produces apples to feed the deer out there. Uh, this is still uh, the William Hamlin Foundation. You can see just some of the, the stonework there, and, and there's most of it uh, is filled in. Uh, there isn't much more to see than that, which is pretty typical of a lot of foundations around. But if we go to the next one. Smith bought one third of lot 18 and built a house and lumber mill on the brook now called Smith Brook. The mill was eight rods up from the bridge, which we have pictures of the bridge. Okay, here is uh, William Durrell's foundation. This is the center chimney cake, well made. Uh, just cut stone, beautiful, beautiful uh, foundation. One of the nicest I've seen. And if we go to one more, yep, and there's some more stonework. Notice that the long piece of granite that is above the ground here is a single piece. It's huge. And it's just amazing that the oxen have to carry that from wherever it came from. Uh, so sometime in 1840, John Jonathan Smith bought William Durrell's house and where his son Ira later lived. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is actually the the uh, well right behind William Durrell's or Jonathan Smith's house later on, uh, right out behind his house was his well, which still has, doesn't look at there, but the water is still very good looking water. Mm -hmm. Is that the one that you reach out the window? No, actually that's the next one down that you can almost take a bucket out the window and that was pretty smart to do back then and not even have to go outside and put a bucket in the well and bring up water and bring it in the house. You got another one? I just, it would add that there were a number of Smiths there and the sons of Jonathan Jr. Iron and his brothers served in the Civil War. Uh, 
interesting enough, they, uh, uh, and you find this when you look at some Civil War uh, soldiers. He signed up in the 25th Maine Infantry, which was a nine-month regiment. And the 25th went <coughs> to Washington and pretty much stayed there, guiding the Long Bridge and uh, coming back when the Battle of Gettysburg started. Uh, he got back. <coughs> and he was lucky. He turned around and signed up in the 17th Maine, which was a three-year regiment, and saw most of the heavy fighting in Gettysburg uh, before he joined it, of course, and the rest of the war. His brother signed up in the 39th Maine and was captured and spent some time in Libby prison in Richmond and when he got home, unfortunately, he died quite soon. Now, I have some artifacts that I found from him. These, this is a Civil War. This was found right at Smith Brook, right at the Foundation. This is a Civil War suspender strap. It has the Eagle and uh, our Army, which I'll pass around, and a main Durango Civil War button with the main state seal on it. Charles Lovis uh, lived on the grounds of the, of the Smith Mill. Uh, he was obviously a, a mill hand, and uh, the house left no trace, so it was probably some type of what we would today call a camp or something, because there was no foundation to explore. Unfortunately, he had a 12 year old daughter who died. 1859 and was buried over on Oak Hill, uh, and the uh, mill closed about that time. <clears throat> and there's the bridge. And if you look at the cut rock that's survived all these years, uh, it's now Snow Mill, Four Wheel Trail. Yeah. Walking trail. It's it's maintained uh, and there's a nice looking nice looking bridge. Now is that down in Junktown? Yes. Where is that? That's up in Junktown on the Junktown Road. I'd be happy to take you guys out there. I told you. Please do. It's gorgeous up there. And we have another. This is a <clears throat> this is an interesting shot. Uh, that tree is ancient and is perched on the bridge of butt and, uh, it's been there ever since i was a kid yeah and i remember seeing that tree <coughs> still yay big around when i was eight years old <coughs> anyway we're going to the tree now is that work that's on the tree was that part of the mill do you think no, no that was just the bridge to get across yeah. the river now the mill was eight rods yeah. upstream and there's no trace of it at all uh, i believe it was a wooden dam and not a stone structure uh, back then because there's not a piece of stone out there anywhere the, the mill <coughs> shows on the hankin map uh, and the bridge was nearby so uh, you can it was probably a pretty busy little area at the time you can tell when you go upstream on just a little ways, it's banked on both sides and comes to a narrow one. I believe the, the dam was right there and backed the water up and he, he had a, a, a sawmill right in that area. As we cross the bridge, we come to Simon Ward. And uh, there were two law, uh, I think there were two lords that show on the map. Uh, he had a, a family there, and apparently uh, it was a, a no work wall saw. Uh, Spurred into one of a lot of uh, detail on him. Do you have anything on him? Well, I call him poor Simon. <laughs> because on the table, I found 50 feet from Simon, uh, Simon's foundation is a 50 cent piece, 1830s 50 cent piece. 
uh, that he must have lost, and I believe that to be about a week's pay back in those days. Yeah, 1813. 1813 coin, but yeah, and it probably was lost in the 1830s, 1840s back then, and uh, that was uh, quite a sum of money for, for somebody back then. The, uh, the next property was uh, Sylvanus Lovell, or Ludwell, as you spell as you spell and there's not an awful lot to say about him. Uh, he had a couple of children, lived in the area, and whether he worked in the mill, we don't know. And <clears throat> there's a Salman Hori, who was another person who lived there. He moved to Jugtown on the last house on the west side of the brook, a road rather, and uh, he, he died there. Uh, he bought uh, about a quarter of Lot 23 uh, from Daniel Smith, the same Smith family. He was, Daniel was the son of Jonathan. Uh, not too much you can say about him. We don't, don't know if there again whether he worked at one of the mills or farm or what he did. That pretty well covers the drug town area right now. And we'll be moving on to uh, Nathan Nutty. And I think probably most people in town know of him. Uh, he was, uh, I guess ingenious was probably a good word. Uh, he designed Baldo, built Baldo, being house. He made tools. Uh, he really was a master builder. Uh, what I didn't know was he also built the mill. And he built the first steam powered mill in the town. Were there others? I don't know. But he built one, and that mill would be located at 121 near his home. Uh, Spur talks about it, and he said in his book, Nathan Nutty Jr. built a steam sawmill about 1850 on the south side of the road west of Pools Corner, uh, which is the junction of 121 and Powhat Road. He later sold it to Joseph Green. And then Spur adds, I don't think he ever did much business with it. And uh, the house, unfortunately, burned in uh, 1913 uh, around Christmas time. Uh, you know whether it was Christmas lights or what. Uh, the next. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that's his house. And the, the remains of the next. Uh, yeah. That's the all that's left of that house that we saw on the previous. It, it looks like it's a little worse for wear. So I don't know whether the, some of the stones have been salvaged or, or not. On the table here is several items I found from uh, Nathan Lenning Jr. Foundation in and around that area, one item being a revolutionary button from 1820, and I believe it be either his father's uniform or or it's earlier than, than Nathan Nutting Jr. because it's the war of 1812, and the, the button's probably in that year, 1812, 1820. It's got an eagle crest on it, and it's very old, and it came from, from right behind his house. Moving down 121, we move <coughs> down to the junction of uh, Job's Way and 121. And this was the, uh, an interesting house, uh, like most of them, it changed hands uh, several times. Uh, it originally was one of the proprietor's uh, lots. James Otis was the owner. And he owned a half dozen or more lots in the town. Uh, and that was in 1776. 
the property was passed on to his heirs. We were in the problem. In 1788, uh, it was sold to Lieutenant Michael uh, Knight as the oldest <coughs> heirs that were found to be deficient in their settling board. Now, you got up your hands on property in those days from the settlement. You were, uh, you were obliged to improve it. And there were many things you could do to improve it. Uh, one of which was log off portions of it, dig a well, build a home, build a barn, uh, make a pasture. The <coughs> Otis family had done none of these things. Uh, so, it was sold to the, the Knights. Uh, Mike passed it to his son Samuel, who was also referred to on occasion as Lieutenant. And then Samuel passed it, sought to pass it on to uh, Sylvester, Ezekiel Jordan Sylvester. Sylvester was born in Maine, but where we pick up his story, he was an overseer in a cotton mill in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, cotton mills weren't the healthiest place to work, and he became ill probably with lung problems, which were common in a, tech, in a cotton mill. He came back to Otisfield and bought the property. Now, there's a little difference of uh, dates here. He bought the property in 1855, but he's listed as a farmer in the U.S. Census in 1850. Uh, he had one child, uh, and we'll get to him in just a second. Uh, we have, yeah, we have the, uh, the remains. The background there is the chimney mount. In the uh, Sylvester property, the ch main chimney was at the back of the house on the edge rather than in the center. And uh, it, uh, we, the place was used as a tavern, was used as a uh, stage, uh, station for a while, and uh, in its, <coughs> Burr mentions the floors creaked and the building was uh, not too good. A picture down on the back display board shows it, uh, but it's an undated photograph, but it looks like it's in a pretty tough shape. Uh, there were a couple more foundation shots there of this huge brick foundation model which uh, would say that it may have been a, a little later building than uh, some of the ones we did in uh, Drug Town. Uh, now, <coughs> Sylvester's son was quite a character. Uh, he was read for the law, was a lawyer in Portland, he was a lawyer in Boston, he was a poet, he was a published author, he was in the legal system as a judge or justice, so, and eventually ended up in uh, New York City, where he died. The relatives or descendants, I guess would be the way to put it, uh, prepared a book, and I believe that the Society did a, a uh, presentation on on him at one time. Okay, here we are. This is another property that changed hands constantly. Started out with James Preston, and it's lot 66. Uh, my understanding is most of the lots were 100 acres. However. A little later on, one of the owners, uh, George Holden, refers to his 
property is 200 acres. Uh, <laughs> says a little more, but that we'll leave it with the 200 acres. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that today we know it as the remains of Camp Sondo and the present Camp Arcadia. So 66 was a big lot. If you look at the maps at the back, you'll see that it, it occupied some space. I went over and I checked the, uh, on the foundation over there. And it appeared to be a barn, which was probably more recent by the type of construction. It was pointed foundation, and there were concrete columns in there. The original barn was just south of the main house, and there's still a very large uh, hollow area in the ground where you can clearly see where there was an old full barn. I think they moved a lot of the stone in and built a newer barn behind it. Well, the, the present owner is uh, Dr. Uh, Paul <coughs> Lucky from Philadelphia, and he uses it as a summer place. And I assume that all of the 20 some odd acres that comprise the camp he owns. And it, it does a lot, uh, Camp Arcadia. And the last uh, place that we Person that I, I just hooked up uh, because I found it a little confusing was Jesse Holden. And uh, he was from Poplar Ridge. And there again, if you check the lot number, it appears to be uh, lot five, and that's probably from that map up on the ridge. Uh, it says here that he raised, raised the frame of a mill. I'm not quite sure what that entailed. And it was in the lower end, it should say Long Meadow, not North. About 1837. So there were mills down in that area, and they came and went. We know there were at least two that were Otisfield mills. We think that the Smith Mill was originally moved this down to what is now lot 172, which is the last lot in Otisville after the land was set off to Naples in 1849. Uh, the apparently it was taken down at some point and moved somewhere. Uh, in talking to Larry, we know that they uh, Hancock no, would have gone into operation sometime in this period. So there were two mills probably on that stream and they weren't that far apart. I think you gave them a, a guess on the two mills. 1840s, 1850s, something like that. The stonework is all still there. It's a, it's a nice big uh, big tower of uh, stone and I used to play there when I was a little kid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's just behind Hancock on the road. Maybe a quarter mile from the road. Yeah, I think we're... I think that concludes our talk for the evening. If, if people have questions, I uh, would entertain them. I'll, I'll probably try to avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? How did they cut the stone? How was the stone cut? Well, it probably was cut with uh, drills and chisels. Remembering now that they couldn't make steel that was like we have today that was really bad. So this would have been uh, a slow process, uh, you know, and to cut something 16 feet long with a hand chisel. I don't believe there were any type of uh, well, we were, we were feeling that was no power. Uh, the only power they had was when the water and that would lend itself to this type of thing. They had long drills, yay ye long, and it was, you turn halfway, pound on, turn again, one, <coughs> one person would turn the, the, the drill and another one would pound, and it would take 
probably a day just to drill a hole that deep uh, using these hand drills. I have one in my barn actually. And they were able to get it nice and even? Well, it would drill a hole and then they would blast it out or, or break it out and hopefully it would break in one nice piece. Uh, so the pieces that didn't were used on the bottom part of the foundation. Jump in. I have, I've heard that they drill the hole and then they put wood in and let it expand. So the person looks for the same that, that makes good sense, actually. That is a, a technique that is used with certain types of stone and works well. Uh, it's a, a basically a wedge arrangement, but you have to be able to identify the vein in the stone for that to work. I had a friend who cut stone, and uh, he could he could decimate a bowl. But he had the ability to identify that trace. And yeah, I'm mean, talking about some of these hollow holes being filled in. Is that from erosion? Or erosion, yeah. Trees, just roots lifting things up and moving them, and, and a lot of erosion, yeah. Probably debris from the house. So, a lot of them get tin cans and you know, pails. Mm -hmm. Snakes. <laughs> And uh, you know, why do you dump if there's this thing next door? I mean, you identified and, and went through this Jumptown um, area. Do you think you you're, you would go and try to find another little hamlet and research that as well? I mean, are you curious about finding other these other lost hamlets? I am, and I have found some, and if you look, all the maps are available online. You can find these old roads or discontinued roads, and you can see, you can walk these places and, and find five or six foundations in a row uh, that are just, you know, on old roads. That's what I do to, to do my hobby. Uh, they're online. You can go to uh, uh, Main State uh, old roads, and there's hundreds of uh, different Towns, so what are towns and what are the hamlets have in town? Uh, there's some in Poland. There's uh, there's, uh, there's one up in Greenville where my camp is and where the old town used to be. And there's an old road and there's probably some renovations <coughs> that I've done up there. But yeah, there, there's a lot of them out there. Do they have names? Not like I know. I just know jump down because I'm around from from around here. But, uh, none that I know of without doing more history on it. Thank you. Um, that's interesting. I come from Kingfield, and there was a down east um, article about Freeman, which is next to Kingfield, an unorganized territory. And there's a store, there were a lot of old cell holes there, and there used to be like a community of people who were shipped there from Portland because they were overrun with poor, the poor. So they shipped them up there. A lot of cellar holes, a lot of history there. Waterford has a couple of big places like that that's on a deserted road with cell holes all over the place uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. Just curious about it, you know, sort of the history of how it was done, because I noticed in these really old ones, they're all laid up dry, you know. Um, and then I was at another location in Massachusetts, actually, a very old house, and it was all mortared in, you know. And I, I was curious, sort of interested whether they did that afterwards. I mean, that's how my house is. It, it was mortared in because water was coming in so fast during the springs that uh, they tried to block it somehow. And, that they've done that to my house, my house has been all boarded in between stones. And stones. I don't think we saw any uh, accommodations. None of the ones yeah. out there, none. No. They were pointed. They were all just open. I mean, that's uh, pretty they amazing. Had they had the choices of the rock they had that they managed to get something flat enough to build a house on sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it was, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, so my, yeah, it does kind of run a little here and there, but that's good. Mary, Mary, have you been uh, to the the solo hole of the old town farm on Swamp Hill Road? I have. I bet it's fairly intact, isn't it? 
it's fairly intact. There's a nice well behind it or beside it. Uh, there's an old stone uh, pillar where you tie your horse or wagon up to that's still there. And I found absolutely nothing there. Oh. <laughs> Maybe a flat button there, and that was about it. And there was a big barn across the street. Uh, and that was that. The, the uh, town of Farm was one of the largest uh, foundations that we've seen. Uh, most of these others are reasonably small, but the town farm seemed to be stretched out uh, along the road if you use that as a guide. Uh, it, it wasn't awfully deep, but it was long. And it was a bigger building, and the way the foundation looks, it was probably uh, two and a half, could have been two and a half stories. It's, it's still up there. The problem with any of these foundations to photograph is it's almost impossible this time of year. The leaves are out and the tr trees are growing in and I went down to do the, to try to get the one at, Son at Camp Songo and you just couldn't couldn't see anything. You took a picture and maybe you saw a rock, mainly what you saw was leaves. So it has, if you're going to do it, it has to be done in the fall or in the spring. Right. And all the ferns are growing in. All the green ferns just all. covered up everything. Could you estimate some of the house sizes from the foundations in Japan? 20 by 30 just seems to be a pretty common size for a lot of the places around here. It, it's hard to tell now because of the, the way the, uh, the burn is, you know, part of the, some of the stones have tumbled over. Sure. So it, I, I suppose you could go in and, and the tape measure and get a good estimate. But I don't think these were big. I, I had the opportunity in uh, 1948 to visit uh, what we call a ghost town in uh, Black Mountain in New York. And it was a little hamlet of about six or seven houses. It was some of them still standing. And it was all alone by one family. And the story they told us was that the Soldiers came back from the Civil War, collected the family and the livestock, and headed west. And we just walked away from these places. And uh, this place was up overlooking uh, Lake George. And it probably was, you know, like a place where you could grow scrub oak and like at some of the places around here. And most of those houses were two room. The ones we that we could get in were two rooms on the first floor and some kind of loft. And uh, it was I don't even remember the fireplace. I just remember, you know, seeing us and it was a, you know something that, you know I've never seen before. Uh, and they all seem to be about the same size. Some of them might have had a shed on the side or, or something like that. But the main house was basically. Now my house is 1830s and I'm on its first corner and mine is about 20 by 30 which is a pretty, my house seems to be the pretty common size of some of the foundations that I've seen out here that I've, I've planted. Yeah, how do you um, go about avoiding trespassing? Avoiding trespassing? <laughs> Most of the places I've done are either out in the middle of nowhere or I've had I've gotten permission from the landlords. I, I think that's a very important thing if you if you're considering doing this. There's permission that always uh, people can take offense at you know you digging in their in their garden. <laughs> Absolutely. I've gone and got a lot of permissions to do most of the places that I've done. Very important. Somebody else had one. Any evidence of graveyards or cemeteries or maple sugaring or some of the things they did, dairy farming in these areas? I, I think that's a good question because that's one I, I came across. The, we saw the men, uh, came across the mention of the 12-year-old girl dying who lived 
a third of the way down uh, Chuck Town Road. And yet she was buried at uh, Oak Hill. Uh, we know that Sylvester was buried at Cedarfest. Uh, they were very careful, seemed to be very careful about where they buried the dead. And they were organized cemeteries, uh, which seemed to vary from state to state as to how they handled it. We didn't see anything, and looking at the maps that I've been able to find, I haven't seen any notation except in organized graveyards. I've not seen any foundation, or any any stone whatsoever, or any burial stone, or any of the any of the places around here. Mm -hmm. I okay. would just add a caveat. Well, there is one up on uh, Bolsters Mills Road, but the house is still there, and there is a a family stone there. My, my family settled Johnson Hill Road, and I've gone to all the old. I found the <clears throat> eight generations ago, and my family settled there. The house of Soho would say at most 20 by 20. But the next uh, farm down was uh, Jordan. Jim Jordan, the famous old school character, and his family came from there. And just a few yards from the house, uh, they were very So it looked like that family uh, buried their dead on their own farm. Yeah. One of the things that you find is certain groups that might use headstones, tombstones, whatever, and loose field stones. And if you've ever visited the Quaker yard over in Doral, you'll find it's a field with stones haphazardly through the field. And the Quakers over there did not uh, go with monuments. And uh, being that I have motives there, I was never able to identify any of them. They just, the stone was put, and that was the end. Someone's buried here. Uh, the stones from the foundation on the land that I bought um, are now in the Crooked River up there in Bolsters Mills. There are a few left there. I didn't realize there was a, a foundation there because there was uh, forsythia and all sorts of trees all around it. And a man came down and asked me if he could have those stones, and that's when I found out it was there. Uh, it was quite a surprise. The place that was there was much larger than the foundation, because uh, I've seen pictures of the, the house that was there. It was the Gilsons. Heath Gilson was born there. Um, and that's and Bolster's Mills, or? No, no. Scribner Hill. Scribner Hill. Um, anyway. Uh, the, the stones went from Scribner Hill Road into the just below the bridge in Bolsters Mills. To, I guess there was a flood or something, and yeah. they wanted to have a, a spillway for fish to go up. So that was that's where the stones are. Well, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate your support.